Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom? Every day is cult film day on Double Feature. It really is. But today is the culty cult film day. The culty cult film day. Yeah. Well done. Thank uh, you. Well spoken by Mr. Michael Kester. My name is Eric, and uh, we have two movies on the show today. We do. Uh, we, uh, with Doll in the title as well. It's a doll bonus. In the title? You get and cult film day and something about also dolls. Also titular songs. Oh, titular songs. Look at all these themes. We're just nailing these themes today. So what's on the show? Uh, we're doing Welcome to the Dollhouse and then Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. That's exciting. We have some chapters so you could skip the ones you haven't seen. Right. Now, the you ones? Prob- probably haven't. <laughs> yeah. Do you like how I'm just going to assume going straight in? You haven't seen either of these movies. And you know what? Don't apologize to us. It's fine. But uh, skip to the end of the... Yeah. You know what? You don't have to apologize, but go ahead and skip our show, you asshole. Yeah. If you don't want to skip, that's fine. You can listen, but we're going to tell you what happens in the movies. Yeah. It's going to get it's spoiled. just something I want people to be prepared for right now. Yeah. We don't want angry emails. We don't want angry people. We don't want people surprised. We just want everybody to have a good time. Yep. Just like Russ. <laughs> but why don't we start with Welcome to the Dollhouse, okay. which actually doesn't want anybody to Nobody's have allowed to a have a good, good time. time. First thing we should talk about. There's about six first things we should talk about. Okay, cool. So let's talk about all those first. Uh, Heather. Let's talk about her first. Right. So you're talking about Heather Maserato. Oh my God. That's there's two Z's in I know. her last name. This it's is like extreme. pizza. Okay, you're right. It's not that hard. <laughs> uh, seen her on the show before. She stole our hearts as Lorna, naked and upside down in Hostel Part Two. What's the Sin City line? She grew up. She filled out. She's yeah. um, in seventh grade here. Yeah, that's uh, awkward. Just as awkward. Actually, yeah, that's true. I guess. <laughs> um, although she does get a lot naked when she gets older, yeah, as we always seem to find true. in double feature. This With is kind of age rem- comes nudity. It's too early to start busting out the Stan Lee. You have to wait till the end and uh, monologue of Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. This is reminding me of that creepy Christina Ricci territory we were oh, in. Oh, with the Adams that? family and the... Yeah, except in Adams family, she was kind of a hip little kid. Right. And I remember having a crush on her when I was young. Sure. But in Welcome to the Dollhouse, it's just super awkward. Really the weird, entire yeah. entire fucking time. Before we get to the awkwardness, what the fuck's going on with the cover of this film? <laughs> Where she's uh, clearly 25 years old and yeah. really hot. What the hell is going I on? I don't there? have an answer for you. I think it's probably just supposed to add to the discomfort. Yeah, the director it really does. likes to make people uncomfortable, and we are no strangers to discomfort on so Double Feature. So it's, it's a bright red cover. It's got the, uh, the cutout kidnap note letters. And um, she looks a lot older, but yeah. she's not no. really. If you actually look at the picture, I think she's still in seventh grade. And she's grade. in Playboy Playmate pose. It's yeah, really strange. Yeah, super, super awkward. Such a good photo for the cover of this, yeah. though. She's got her hair kind of teased out, so she looks older. Everything about her looks older, but the face, which I guess is still true today. So I that's, don't yeah, really know what to say about still that. Still accurate. Now, this is the first movie we've actually done on the show by Todd Salons. Okay. Uh, who right. is known for a lot of things. <laughs> Let's say uh, independent creep factor uh-huh. and greater surplus of human misery. Yeah, yeah. That, would be, uh, that would be Todd. He's basically the polar opposite of one Miranda July back when we did oh, sure. me and you and everyone we know. And right. she's all about celebration and everybody's happy and included. And it's still creepy and weird. Right. Yeah, he... that's uh, that's Todd, but uh, make it everybody feel terrible. Yep. <laughs> Love you, Todd. Well, so this is part of, uh, it was just a, a couple tiny episodes ago, uh, we were talking about dark comedies when we talked yep. about Reanimator. Okay. Can't stop talking about Reanimator. You should never stop talking about Reanimator. Fucking good. If you didn't see Reanimator and you skipped that show, first of all, thanks for skipping it. Uh, secondly, you didn't skip it. You spoiled yourself. But go ahead and watch Reanimator. It's great. People are skipping this, though, so they're not even, no one they're has not even any hearing idea what we're talking about. But in Reanimator, we had mentioned a specific breed of dark comedy. Yeah. That dark comedy encapsulated a lot of different sort of subgenres. Yeah. There was a lot of, of different methods kind of used in that. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't think we could do better than 
Welcome to the Dollhouse to contrast against Reanimator. Yeah, it's pretty true. It Welcome to the Dollhouse, it's funny, but every time you laugh, you feel awful for laughing. Sure, sure. And you're only laughing at horrible things. Yeah, Nothing right. funny happens. You're right. just, it's almost a defense mechanism. Yeah, yeah. It's just something happens and it's so awful that you just have to laugh. It's just this yeah. miserable situation. Well, and it's hard too. you know, I wanted to watch these, uh, these somewhat close together so we could kind of look at the, the two different types sure. of comedy. I always look at comedy like a puzzle, right? So if you have a punchline, you construct the joke backwards, uh-huh. or I guess you could do that vice versa, but that seems to be what's easier to me. A lot of people find our show to be hilarious. I think it's probably unintentionally yeah. hilarious. But I don't think of myself as a naturally funny person, so I have a hard time explaining comedy. Because I feel like if you get comedy, you almost become funny just by getting it. It's true. You you, can construct a joke because you know the puzzle. It's just like cooking. Is it just like cooking? If you know what's in something, it's a hell of a lot easier to make it. Yeah, you get the ingredients and then you can formulate humor. You can at least uh, make what uh, might be evaluated as a joke. You won't be a great comedian. But you can uh, formulate a joke. Something that someone at the very least will stare at you, cock their head and go, was that a joke? Right. Although in a comedy like this, maybe it's just the staring and the cocking of the head. Staring and cocking. Check. All right. But inevitably, what I'm trying to get back to is dark comedies. Uh, This is the dry, awkward, painful type of dark comedy. (laughs) You know, I think it, it really gets to you're not laughing out loud. That's the first key difference I noticed between something like Reanimator and this. Right. In Reanimator, we talked about you might go through and not realize there's jokes. Mm -hmm. And that's not terribly the case in Reanimator, but it's the case in in some dark comedies. I think Welcome to the Dollhouse is a perfect example of you could really watch this entire movie and not get that there's any comedy to it. I feel like people who watch this, and if if any of our listeners watch this and just thought it was horrible and felt <laughs> bad and didn't find it funny. Be glad we didn't do happiness. Yeah. Is that well, yeah. What you want well, to say about off that? that? Was happiness supposed to be funny? Um, yeah, it's hilarious. Okay. Happiness is another film by this uh, director, a film we joke about all the time. It will also make you feel miserable. Go on. If you watch this and you didn't think it was funny, I feel like you missed the point. The film is... It's not laugh out loud funny. It's not fucking feel good funny. No. But it is supposed to be funny. You're supposed to laugh at the misery. Yeah. It's still supposed to suck. Yeah. You're supposed to feel like garbage going through this film. But you're, I think a large part of what the film is doing is trying to get you to laugh at how much garbage you're wading through. Yeah, for sure. You're... You may get a little relief through that, and I think that's the best you could hope to accomplish, yeah. is going, man, don't these people have it bad. Right. Or just like you said earlier, laughing through sheerly how terrible the situations are. Mm-hmm. You know, to get to where that layer of comedy is most obvious, I think the biggest thing I pick up is the music choices. You know, there's a lot of, not necessarily music cues, but maybe just music is a, a key factor in making those jokes. Yeah. The jokes surround music. I get the the feeling that Todd is just a fan of comedy through music. And maybe that's because music is one of the more subtle ways. It's not visual. It's not on the screen. The characters aren't doing it or aren't doing it all the time in, right. in the case here. But you have the the first thing I noticed was the ballet just mocking Dawn. You know, right. Dawn will have something awful happen, and then her younger sister will just prance in in a little ballet number, yeah. which is only loosely related to music. But those are the kind of jokes you're going to get through this movie. Sure. The sort of things where it's a subtle cue. It's a very subtle, something bad happened, and now a ballerina is going to prance across right. the screen. Well, I think Missy is this really good character because she's got it made. Yeah. Even this horrible, she gets kidnapped, right? Sure, sure. The most horrible thing that you can think sure. that would happen to a little girl yeah. happens, and she loved it. Yeah. She gets, she what did candy, they say? Candy she, or candy on TV. And yeah. McDonald's. Yep. And all she had to do was dance for the man. Sure. I mean, the dude's fucking sick. Yeah, right. And that's a whole different tragedy but missy still has it made from the beginning of the film all she does is dance and live a carefree life she calls the shots around the house yeah right and anytime she's juxtaposed against dawn anytime you see the two of them interact 
I mean, it's hilarious in the darkest way. But the jokes aren't just happening to Dawn, you know right. what I mean? It's not just, uh, let's make Dawn feel bad. Sure. It's the audience, too. Yeah. I really do feel like a lot of times the dark elements that are happening... You know, okay, so she gets kidnapped, right? Yep. You were mentioning that uh, that kidnapping, and you obviously have the biggest fears in the world for her. But there's another musical moment. There's It seems a lot of times like when you're not getting ballet or the occasional opera music in here, the only other option in the world is metal. That's yeah. the only other thing the movie can do for you. That's your only other uh, potential relief from it. But uh, there's that scene where uh, her mom gets the phone call. And says, uh, you know, they found the tutu. And that's just the best fucking trend. They found the tutu, cries hysterically, yeah. and then just smash cut to rock music. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> just fucking no comfort at all yeah. to you. But there are characters in the film that play music, and that's funny too. There's the out of tune band. Yeah. Uh, or the in love music when, you know, Dawn looks over and watches Steve sure. eat cereal or whatever. Yeah. These are your insights into, hey, this is a this is a joke right now. Sure. When we get to Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, that's a movie where a lot of people go, uh, does the director know this is a joke? Yeah. So the music is here to go, eh, the director knows this is a joke. Sure. You know, the director knows everybody is safe to have a little giggle here. It's going to be okay. So Steve joins this band. They have this garage band. Okay. Right? Yeah. When Steve joins the band, the first time we hear the band collectively with yeah. him... I don't realize that it's not part of a soundtrack until sure. Dawn wandered. Did you have that same feeling? Yeah, at first I was kind of wondering what she was... Because she just wanders out of her room like she sure. smells pie. Yeah, right. What and is she doing? you kind of realize the music's getting louder, clearer. She steps out a door, it becomes less muffled. Right. And that's when you realize that it's coming from the garage and, and it's this band fronted by this hunky high school kid. Sure, sure, hunky, I like that. That's a perfect term to describe Steve. So long-haired, dreamy Steve is singing, yep. and uh, surprise, this was the garage band, which is the best because that's how you know they got better, Yeah, is in your head, you didn't think, wow, this is that shitty band from sure. the garage. You just went, oh, there's background music. Mm -hmm. They play the Happy Anniversary song later, oh which is one of my favorite of uh, that band's singles. Yeah, it's a really stellar one. Which is also a pretty apparent joke, right? Yeah. Oh, just yeah. total shit song. Sure. And it's, they eat that cake, that terribly airbrushed looking Ugh. cake, yeah. which it's hard for me not to say there's visual gags. You know, I want to say that's the only visual gag, but the tutu is a visual gag, Yeah, right? The tutu pulled halfway up her abdomen as she prances around the <laughs> screen. It's clearly a visual gag. Yeah, well, I think a lot of, and this is really directly in reference to both the anniversary song and the cake, a lot of the, quote, jokes in the film sure. are more just heavily examining what would really happen. Sure, yeah. And kind of pointing out the blatant, annoying factors that yeah. go into everyday life something like a horrendously ugly cake yeah. or a youth band thinking they know how to write a song yeah sure stuff like that but you're not involved so you can step back and just think it's stupid instead well, yeah. of trying to invest yourself in oh those are my neighbors though and sure, i know sure. they're good people their cake's just ugly yeah it's not even worst case scenario right because like you said earlier she gets abducted it could get far worse this isn't a cacophony of the worst possible things that could happen to human beings. Instead, it's uh, it's almost painful in how mundane and yeah. averagely bad the exactly. things are. I think if there's something that's really dark here, it is how expectedly average it is. Mm -hmm. There are things that go wrong. They're just everyday things. They're things like you get a cake and it looks terrible or the band is terrible. Right. Someone goes missing. You get rejected at school. If there's anything dark about the movie, truly dark, it's exposing that kind of real suburban darkness. It's uh, not even really heightened for cinema. And I think that's why it hits home a little deeper, makes yeah. you a little more uncomfortable. It's not cinematic, didn't wear your pants to school darkness. It's this shit probably actually happened to you when you went yeah, to school. Yeah, exactly. You've probably seen or been in a crappy band. You know, you've been made fun of or picked on. You've gotten detention or otherwise been reprimanded sure. for something that wasn't your fault. Yeah. These are the mundane, crappy things that happen to you in your own life. Right. 
They're not the sort of things where if I asked you to tell me the worst thing that happened in your life, that would not go in this movie. Right. Instead, it would be the things that are just bad enough for you to go, that's, you know what, it's boring enough, I don't even right. want to tell you. The only really horrible thing that happens is Missy gets kidnapped, and that turns out to be okay. Well, and it's the climax, yeah. too. So the film, <laughs> the film tricks you into thinking there is some really awful thing, but therein lies this sort of gambit. Because if the film does something truly terrible, then it has to reach a resolution at some yeah. point. We're going to get a payoff if it's really that bad. She's going to come back and the day will be saved and everyone will be happy. Or uh, it'll be catastrophic in how bad it is. Right. It will be, you know, she's found raped and dead. And even that is kind of a cinematic payoff. You know, that's the, the type of thing where we feel like ultimately this came to a point. Mm-hmm. What's more uncomfortable is if it turns out she's okay, she was just gone for a couple days, it was a huge inconvenience to everybody, and then Dawn is mocked as a result, you know what I mean? It's the least possible satisfying outcome for our main character Mm -hmm. at all. And there's kind of this twisted irony to that moment, too. And the twisted irony would be another component of the dark humor. This is just one example, but I mean... Dawn has a fantasy about being the hero of this situation. She goes out to do something heroic and she puts up all these flyers and she goes out to the city and she's thinking, you know, she has this dream that she finds her sister and everybody loves her. Her parents love her and her 10 boyfriends love her and her class loves her, right? Her class celebrates her and cheers her name. Mm -hmm. And then reality kicks in. And this is what I'm talking about it being... Great that her sister's back, but as a result, she has to give a speech, and it's literally the opposite of what she thought would happen. Yeah. Her sister comes back, and she is mocked in unison. Just that the class might have cheered her in unison, instead, they all decide her speech is boring, and nobody cares, yep. and they make fun of her name. Publicly humiliated. <laughs> Worst thing that could happen to the character. Blase thing to happen in the film. There's also this weird kind of little irony in some of the jokes uh, where they make it very quick and throwaway so as not to alert you to the fact there may be humor. Right. But uh, like when you find out it's Joseph Caston, right? And he, yeah. He's Santa. Sure. Just one little thing. Yeah. No one in the town suspected it. He was Santa. Everybody goes, oh, that makes sense in a weird way. And the film's already moved on. Yeah. It's already well beyond that. So I want to talk about another one of Todd's fascinations. Uh, He has some seriously fucking Joe Dante levels of suburban exploration in him. You know, these... We um, did Gremlins, we did Small Soldiers. Suburbs films. Yeah, absolutely. He did a film called The Burbs. Are you familiar with this? Oh, I am. Yeah, starring Tom Hanks. Well, yeah, and he's in good company. I mean, John Waters is another director that has that suburban fixation. David Lynch, you know, both uh, double feature directors. Um, Kevin Smith kind of has a, a yeah, Jersey a way. suburban thing, or mm-hmm. at least looking at, you know, stuff like being at the mall or right. working at a convenience store. Not much for city life, not a big Hollywood epic, uh, instead local fucking bum work. Yeah. And you know, that's just a few of the directors we've looked at on the show. There's other directors too, with this suburban fixation, uh, who treat it as the ideal backdrop, sometimes even the plot of their film. There's something very bizarre about the suburbs. We talked, I think it was on the Deliverance episode about City Dangerous versus Suburb Dangerous, right? right? There we were talking a lot about the really backwoods kind of danger. But I think mostly to outsiders or to previous inhabitants, if you're unfamiliar with the suburbs, it's a really bizarre and kind of uncomfortable thing. Everything looks the same Mm -hmm. and... There's things you accept as just okay in the suburbs. Right. There's a, a lifestyle that does not exist in yeah. other places. And that often seems to be where the fixation lies with these directors. But you almost always see that as being dark. There's never a suburban focus that isn't either not actually the focus, but just the setting of the film. Or maybe again in that, that Kevin Smith exception, where it isn't about how dark the suburbs yeah, are. Or at least how twisted. Yeah, it's about being twisted. It's the, you know, when we talked about Blue Velvet, that was the seedy underbelly of sure. the suburbs. Well, and then there's also something like Edward Scissorhands. Yeah, definitely. Where the suburbs are still painted to be this wonderful place. Sure. But as soon as some foreign body invades, it just gets fucked 
and yeah. everybody kind of comes out of their perfect shell and it sure. becomes a twisted fucked up society well and when we talked about edward scissorhands that was another thing where we were doing kind of a fish out of water yeah. show there but edward didn't really seem like the most foreign element no not at all you know as us watching the film a lot of it was edward's fucked up but aren't all these people from the suburbs pretty yeah. fucked up too the way they exploited him showed their hand as being a far more fucked up brood yeah right well and then you mentioned the burbs right yeah. the joe dante yeah. movie it's literally about something dark happening in yeah, the suburbs. Yeah. That's the fucking plot synopsis. Yep. Tom Hanks is in the suburbs and then something dark is yeah. going on. What is it he has to investigate with his neighbors? I mean, you couldn't get more direct than that. This is where Todd really stands out as a director playing with this theme because his version of the suburbs isn't so shady. Yeah. It's again, the realism. The fact that this is the suburbs you could actually take the train out to, or excuse me, the metro. Mm -hmm. This is the suburbs that uh, you and I really grew up yeah. in. It's so real, and these things are so day in and day out that we don't have to have a mad scientist in the basement sure. or a crime syndicate or something supernatural about right. the suburbs. This is just, hey, suburbs. Let's take a second to talk about how really fucked up they are. Another element, and I think this gets into a lot of Salon's work, is sex. Yeah. And that's, every time we've said awkward on this show, I feel like we're talking about the sexual relationships. Yes, yeah, it's true. Where do you even start on that stuff? It's a weird place because it's sex at a premature level. It's before the gravity of something like rape has actually set in. Sure. You know, sex isn't, sex yet it's just another activity like drawing right or playing right. tag yeah and you know that's of particular interest for double feature we did teeth and i remember talking a lot on teeth about kids being sexually active a lot younger than right. is considered okay considered sure. a norm that's a long-standing idea on our show we see in all of these different movies geared for different ages or starring people of different ages Occasionally, we'll come across a film that really treats sex like something you discover in middle school or in sure. the beginning of high school, which is when your body becomes sexually active at right. a natural time. Our writer-director here is not taking advantage of that particular thing. Mm -hmm. Instead, he's saying, yeah, all right, you're sexually active when you're younger. That makes sense. That's just what happens in my film. But what you're not prepared for is these heavier concepts. Sure. While you are sexually active, and that is true, and closeting kids from sex and pretending they're not sexual till they're 18 is ridiculous, right. you don't know what you're doing when you're younger. Right. You have no idea. Half of the things I reference on a regular basis on this show, I did not know what they were when I was 12. Probably right. anything I sure. reference uh, on this show. And I think that's another dark part of sexuality when you're younger, too, is because we treat it like a taboo and nobody talks about it. You don't know what any of this fucking stuff sure. is. And that's can, the dangerous part. Yeah, and it can be a it, it it can be a scary thing, not for the kids, but to think about a kid who's just never heard of rape, right? Yeah, right. Just decides I'm gonna rape someone, sure. not because they feel evil or because they have a strong sexual urge, right? But because they know what rape is and nothing, none of the baggage. Yeah, they have they have no background for yeah. it because people have not talked about it. You know, the way they treat rape in this movie, I mean, um, specifically Dawn and her classmate talking. Her classmate threatens to rape her, but also kind of offers sure. to rape her. You know, that's that weird blurred line. I feel like if anybody's prepared to see a movie about that and talk about those themes, it's you and I who yeah. have discussed, sure. you, who have tried to tear away the baggage of this stuff before. Uh -huh. But even with all of that going in, even with... Uh, the people who listen to the show, maybe having heard those conversations, it's still, even for us, that blurred line is so fucking awkward. Yeah. How do you talk about that they might start dating their kids, they're flirting? It could be cute, but all of a sudden their verbiage is about sex. Sure. It's about rape. And that makes it dark and fucked up. And bizarre up. and strange, but also endearing. You it get does, this yeah. weird twisted moment, leave it to Heather Maserato, sure. to uh, give you a moment where you're not sure if it's endearing or you want it to go away. Well, and then the music makes it even worse. Right. 
the music basically creeps up on you and goes, oh, romantic. Isn't sure. this awkward? Well, there's this, she asks, so you're not going to rape me today? Right. I guess I don't have to be home. Yeah, She's right, basically right. saying, rape me, please. She's a little disappointed by yeah. it. And he says, I'm not raping you today. And the music's like, aw, yeah. they want to rape each other. I feel like this is a film for people who have seen so many goddamn films that they feel like they know what to expect or they're comfortable with, you know, different themes or ideas. This is definitely a film that challenges yeah. you, that attempts to alienate you, and that tries to push you in places, really, it tries to find places that no human being is comfortable with without just going for the most offensive sure. fucking bizarre right. because that would be more comfortable. Yeah. That's Lars von Trier at this yeah. point. Well, right? All you have to do when it gets really fucked up is you just go, Oh, they're trying to fuck with me. That that's Is that how you get your yourself through this film well, and you're okay? Not with this film, but no. films that are intentionally yeah. trying to make you feel uncomfortable. Sure. You just brace yourself for the most fucked up thing and it doesn't phase you. Well, and that's where you get something like Martyrs where it really has to, it has to be far more fucked up than you're ever prepared for. If we're going to play that game, it has to really step up. Yeah. Instead, this film goes, uh, you might try and prepare for that, but we're going to pull it back a little bit and put you right on the cusp of things you ever thought you could be comfortable with. So this being a new director for our show, somebody we've never talked about really quick, we tied a lot of the things we talked about back to him. One other thing that's kind of interesting about his work is that he makes these sort of faux sequels. Uh There's a movie called Palindromes that came out, which kind of, it's a a spirited sequel, sort of. Sure. It's again, it's that blurred line. It's that really awkward place where... It's kind of a sequel. It sort of features the same characters. It's in the same universe. You wouldn't call it a spirited sequel because that would be purely just, oh, I wanted to tackle the same themes or this goes together. You know, when we Uh talk about people who make trilogies or whatever, movies that aren't Blood and Ice Cream trilogy kind Uh of things, which is a bad example because it's not even really a trilogy, but you know what I mean. Sure. Same idea. People would like these movies. They go together in a set all the way over to the other side of the spectrum, which is... Kill Bill Part 2. Sure. This falls somewhere strangely in the middle where it's kind of picking up same characters or something vaguely and we're not going to address it moving on, which is probably a good place for us to be. Yeah. So instead, let's uh, address something easier to tackle, which is, I think I have a mistake in my notes. It says Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. If you want to talk about sequels officially versus unofficially. (laughs) Yeah, actually, that was a great segue, wasn't it? Opens with a disclaimer that it has nothing to do with Valley of the Dolls. Then goes on to be a basic remake of Valley of the Dolls, except more suitable for the double feature audience, at least the double feature hosts. I was going to say, except has more Haji. Was that not the right answer? Haji is always the right answer. So we're looking at 1970s Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, which is the Russ Meyer and Roger Ebert movie featuring the girl we talked about on Faster Pussycat, Mm -hmm. Haji, who we both said we were fans of. Uh, Not a huge part in this, but cool to see her in anything ever again. All right. So the big question, and I love to answer these in the rarity that we can. You see this movie and Roger Ebert's name pops up and Uh you think, like film critic Roger Ebert? Yeah. Yes, film critic Roger Ebert. This is a movie written by the same writer of the book, Your Movie Sucks. Yep. Most people are going to come to the show and wonder, what the fuck? How did yeah. this happen? Yeah. Where did it come from? Why does this thing exist? And why does this thing exist? If, uh, if you ask yourself that question after a movie, I really like this to be a good place. You can come for that. Yeah. Furthermore, I want to know what that movie is because I love those (laughs) movies. I love the why does this exist? How could this come into reality movies? So while I won't pretend to understand anything that happens in Beyond the Valley of the Dolls, uh, partially because I haven't seen Valley of the Dolls, which Uh may or may not make a difference. I'll ask you about that in a second. You've seen Valley of the Dolls, right? I have seen Valley of the Dolls. Good. Maybe I can bring a little what the hell happened here and then you could fix the what the hell happened here. So Ebert, uh, here's the, I mean... If I just want to ruin this all right away, I'll give you the real answer. The real answer is Ebert started doing movie reviews. His big one was published in, um, I think it was Night of the Living Dead that was in Reader's Digest in like 1969 or something. This movie comes out in 1970. So the real answer is he wasn't really doing movie reviews yet. Right. He was fucking young, right? What is that? 40 years ago now, yeah. right? 42 goddamn years ago, uh, 43, if you look at when he actually wrote the movie, 
that was a long time ago. That's mm-hmm. not the Roger Ebert we know today. No. It's not the Roger Ebert you have either scoffed at or adored or sure. been... This uh, is Roger Ebert long before his thumb was anywhere. <laughs> right. My third option was going to be willfully oblivious to, which mm-hmm. I think is uh, kind of kind of the approach you and I take. Yeah, definitely. So I'm not going to talk about his film reviewing career or anything like that because I honestly don't know. I don't care about I film reviews. I do not give a shit. I feel like it's been a good half a year or so since we mentioned that we don't give a fuck about film reviews mm-hmm. in the slightest. So I don't really know anything about that. Maybe he's awesome at them. Maybe he's not. Maybe they're not worth having at all anyways. Just not the approach you and I take. So this isn't my platform to come on here and pick on Roger Ebert. Rather, I'm curious how a guy who does film criticism and has written a book called Your Movie Sucks creates a movie that other critics, let's say, uh, consider questionable. Yeah. So he got in with Russ Meyer pretty early on uh, by writing about Russ's movies. Mm -hmm. And I guess they became friends through that and started working on these projects. Now, we've seen a couple of... um, Russ Meyer's projects before we saw Faster Pussycat Kill sure. Kill. We did Up on the show yeah. in a really obnoxious spot that I loved. And, <laughs> uh, look back fondly on. Ebert actually wrote part of Up, uh-huh. contributed a bit to Up, contributed to uh, later, I, I believe it's Beneath the Valley of the Ultra Vixens. Yeah. Although there's so many plays on titles in that particular title, I have trouble remembering it. And he did, uh, he did this interesting Bambi thing I'll talk about later. Okay. But, yeah. But, I mean, that makes sense who Russ Meyer is, if you've heard back to those shows. We did Faster Pussycat with Mean Girls as yeah. a year-ender, and I'm still super proud of that one. We've really, uh, we've been doing pretty well with these Russ Meyer shows. Yeah, definitely. Turns out you add Russ Meyer to anything, and it's a, it's a funny idea for a pairing. <laughs> but so we've covered Russ Meyer before. This film in particular is strange because of the Valley of the Dolls connection or yeah. lack of connection or purposefully non-connected. or So the studio wants to do this super exploitation film. Sure. I mean, if you ever needed a film to explain exploitation, this yeah. might be a good example. It's pretty high up there. This movie got made in a way that uh, we haven't talked about a lot before, but I imagine a lot of the movies we talk about, especially the weirder, the how the fuck did this get made movies. Right. This broke studio at the time basically rolled the dice with this film. Now, when you're, uh, as a producer, an executive producer, a studio head, whoever makes these decisions, when you're deciding to green light projects Mm -hmm. or buy weird stuff or buy great expansive surefire hits, you probably compose, and I'm not the accountant for the studio, I don't fucking know, but I would imagine most of your movies are surefire hits. They're what specific genres are hot, what could we make a buck off of, What's get you know the Pirates of the Caribbean kind of thing? Sure. Right? What is Vampires. guaranteed to print fucking money? But then you take a little bit of your budget and you sprinkle it among these projects that probably will go nowhere. But maybe, maybe if the gamble pays off, they could become huge cult hits. They could make a bunch of money on DVD later. They could fill some kind of niche somewhere. The things like Repo, right? right. We talked about Repo being appealing to the what the fuck demographic yeah that maybe it was so weird it just might work yeah and so the studio hopes that that'll find an audience and they just roll the dice they're not concerned too terribly with how to market it sure just make a weird film stick it out there yeah basically the opposite of anything roger corman would ever do right yeah although another studio might hire on roger corman in the way that this did russ meyer so you know russ meyer is a guy who made these movies found a lot of joy in them Mm -hmm. probably wasn't super concerned in the, uh, let's say, the Herschel Gordon sense of sure. how do we make a film, you know, have mass appeal or how does no. it make money? I think he had a lot of fun and he really liked filming the stuff he filmed. You got it. At the same time, he sort of knew there was a business here. Sure. He knew that if you film naked people, other people will pay you to see it. So the studio goes, uh, okay, well, why don't we get this guy who makes borderline adult films sure to direct this and he's got that pal who writes some movie stuff right i don't know that guy can write it and they basically said go nuts with it do whatever the fuck you want (laughs) and uh we're gonna hire you on and let you capitalize on this uh title and hopefully it works yes it did (laughs) so i believe the uh the opening idea was we'll do a true sequel and by the time the studio started assessing their funding. Yeah. They just said, let's give this to Russ Meyer and hey, Russ, do whatever you want with this and we'll put it out as, you know, 
Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. And hopefully people will see that title. We don't want to mislead anyone. We'll make the fucking tagline on the poster. You know how much I love sure. taglines. The tagline for this film is literally, this is not the sequel to Valley of the Dolls. This is like nothing that's ever come to cinema before yeah. or something like that. So in the tagline itself was, hey, just so you know, this isn't a sequel. The movie opens with a stupid studio. Uh-huh. This is not a sequel to Valley of the Dolls. Please no one be upset at us. So there was still that angle to it. But uh, beyond that, they were hoping people would walk by the poster, go, oh, the sequel. Oh, it's sure. not a sequel. And then correct their friends. And yeah. it would get people talking. So it's Russ Meyer, but it's different from the usual Russ Meyer. It's very different. There's a lot. There's a lot. My poster child for Russ Meyer is, I mean, obviously Faster Pussycat. Sure. But he did a slew of films around that time, Mud Honey mm-hmm. and Motor Psycho, that are very similar. They kind Warna. of fill the yeah. same niche. And then we get something like Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. And the one thing that we have always touted about Russ Meyer, he has a very typical body type. And for men, too, the square-jawed, broad-shouldered sure. yeah. guy. This defies all of that. Yeah, all the guys right. are scrawny. All the girls are... They're attractive. They're curvy. But they're not Russ Meyer hourglass curvy. Yeah, right. And then on top of that, there's a lot more character depth. And the characters are a lot more archetypical and a lot less sure. strong female, weak male, strong male, weak female. Sure. Watch them duke it out. Yeah, that was really all of the other movies, especially Up. But you know, you're right. That's every movie. That's sure. every Ross Meyer movie. But in this film, you get something like the agent, right? The uh, mm-hmm. the older guy who kind of symbolizes the older generation. First of all, everyone's not the same age. Yeah, which is, exactly. Which also seems like a thing Russ Meyer kind of does. Yeah. And Unless someone's playing the old guy. True. That's very true. Sorry, but go on. But we get these characters who have different motivations, who are based in different... I mean, they're from different worlds, right? The whole basis of the film is that we have these people moving from the south to la they're completely uprooting from not i want to say lower maybe lower intensity lifestyle sure and moving to the high intensity 1970s hollywood the sexual revolution right right and then they're forced to be with these people who are so heavily sexually fueled or just professionally fueled and ready to make money and make themselves sure that's something that russ meyer just doesn't do normally it's chicks Dudes make chicks angry, chicks kick ass. Yeah, right. Ideally, tits and probably fucking. Well, so here he makes a movie that, above all else, is a satire. And sure. it's a, Very a intentional satire. Yeah, a parody. And then it's also kind of got this rock musical thing and right. uh, the usual sexploitation we can't avoid. But then it's a moral tale, too. Mm-hmm. You know, in that uh, post-Tate, you know, Valley of the Dolls right. coming back again, feeling some obligation to that a cautionary tale of show business. But I mean, then one character becomes a fucking paraplegic and it's a serious drama. All right. of a sudden there's, there's a sure. fucking dramatic organ, you know, right. and it's ambitious and it's a movie that they wrote. I mean, this is the one I always think about Roger Ebert for, even though he worked on the other ones, cause they really worked together. Whereas Roger Ebert just wrote the screenplay for this straight uh-huh. out, wrote it and he wrote it in six weeks. And uh, you know, him and Meyer really came up with a lot of it as they went along filming. So if nothing makes sense by the goddamn end of the movie, that would be why they're just sort of coming up with it as they go. Right. But it centers around, you know, this musical piece. This was uh, trying to show that 60s era of partying. So it wasn't just in order to get a record deal, go to Los Angeles. Sure. It was, hey, that's where the party scene is at. Right. If you are in a band and you want to make it and have fun, you go to Los Angeles. And then they have that, you know, if there was any debate on whether or not to go to Los Angeles, we go ahead and flesh that out in a sort of word montage. Yeah, that's really a a half rhyme, half poetic. That's that was a very bizarre moment. Before the the Kelly affair bursts out into is it song if you just sing in your car, but you're in a band? I don't know. Uh, And that's really I mean, that's the primary similarity to the original stealing that premise and going with it. And I think that's kind of where they started. After watching this, and I feel like this is true, but I don't know, do you get used to the way the movie's cut together and what it's doing, or... Does it fix itself halfway through? Yeah, right. Does it get less... Because the word thing to me seems... We started this movie, and I went, oh, fuck, I remember. Every time I watch this movie, (laughs) it's hard to get through because it's... 
edited in a in a way where people almost talk over each other right. and it's just one clip after another clip after another clip of quippy dialogue yeah. spoken in a straightforward manner right is the beginning of the craziest scene or no i think it continues the same way you just learn to you develop weed out what's not important sure you learn to see when a character is talking you kind of acknowledge who they are who they're talking to and then just reactions you don't get to pay attention to what's being said i didn't realize that z-man talked like Shakespeare until it was pointed out yeah, because I right. wasn't paying attention to what he was saying, yeah. just how he was acting and how people were reacting. Oh, you got to have a filter on. Otherwise you can't, you have no yeah. idea what the fuck is going on in this movie. I still have no idea. So tell me what the fuck is going on in this movie. Well, I, if you, if we want to really paint it and make it really clear and I can do this very quickly in a very timely and efficient fashion, Valley of the Dolls is essentially this Hollywood story of three women who all decide they want to be famous Hollywood movie stars, singers, starlets, you know, the drill. So they go out and it's a cautionary tale of okay, sure. what can happen. And it was made by the adult generation. It was made by big Hollywood at the time. It's really a really successful movie sure. too, for how terrible it supposedly was. Yeah, it was awful. And this film is, it's similar. It's a cautionary tale, but it ends in a different light it ends where although all these horrible things happen eventually they acclimate to the more intense lifestyle okay that sure the music scene has given them they bad stuff happens good stuff happens in return it ends with a three-person wedding i mean what the right, fuck right this is a movie that is about learning your boundaries it's about taking control of being in a high velocity situation. Sure. It's about knowing who's not on your side and when to trust who. And making good decisions, yeah. I suppose. It's, too. I mean, that it's, would be it's the about other thing. morality, but it's not about forcing morality. Sure. It's about how the younger generation was leading the sexual revolution. And just because they were fucking around and doing drugs, that's not what ruined lives. It yeah. was the individual psychotic people who couldn't control and couldn't really adjust to the environment of the party scene that ended up ruining lives. I'm talking particularly about Z-Man who yeah, ends right. up being Superwoman. Sure. He couldn't handle it. He's the reason that horrible things happen to people. These people would have been just fine. Yeah. They could have handled it. Yeah. But he was an exception to the rule as opposed to what the other film would have you believe is Hollywood corrupts. It all comes down to the fact that this one person who is basically um, Lisa from Girl Interrupted. Angelina Jolie's character. Right. A total sociopath who gets all these people in his, her pocket by doing them all these favors and showing them, whining and dining them. Yeah, right. Showing them the life of the party scene. Sure. And then they owe him and he just takes advantage and he fucks with them and watches them make bad decisions and leads them down the wrong road. And once he loses control, just like in Girl Interrupted, he loses control of himself. Yeah. And he starts making horrendous choices that end up weighing on everybody else. That's sort of chaos for the sheer purpose of excitement. Sure. For entertainment value. Yeah. Stir things up just to see what happens. You know, when we mentioned cautionary tale, I almost don't like the phrase because it's never actual cautionary tale. It's more... Shock value. Don't, it, yeah. Don't do this. Something awful will happen. Yeah. And it sounds like this movie may be asking you to exercise actual caution. Sure. Whereas something like Valley of the Dolls was literally don't go out and it's reefer madness. I was just going to say Hollywood. reefer madness. Kind of reminds fiends. me as, as you describe it. I'm I keep thinking of uh, Showgirls yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Now, when you talk about those archetypes and that being new to Meyer, I think that was one of the things specifically written in too. You know, there's a lot about uh, as a commentary of. Uh, Valley of the Dolls, but also of the plot structure of these kind of movies, these sort of road trip, what did we learn today, sure. you know, cautionary tale movies, and those characters and who those characters become. It's an early glance at Ebert saying, you know what, I watch a lot of movies, I've seen the same six fucking Hollywood characters, sure. but then going out of his way at the end of the movie to literally do that ending narrative part to say all right i want to make sure this is actually a cautionary tale and no one reads into this as just being the same thing as valley of the dolls right. or as any of these other films i want to spell out what these people did wrong so there's no confusion right you know as you watch it you're going 
wow, this is really heavy. They're really telling you what's going on here. But that's his point is he doesn't want people to walk away and think, were they serious? Did they know what they were doing? And people still thought that. It's hard to watch this movie and not think that. But you get that ending bit. So they make sure if they're going to do any moralizing or any, here's what these characters should have watched out for, that they're figuratively uh, force feeding it to you to make sure that everybody's on the same page. Yeah. Also, it's the editor from I Love Lucy. I mean, it's deliberate yeah. for people. It has to be deliberate. Yeah. I'm just saying he knows how to edit a thing together. I right? guess. Yeah. He did have a job for a long time. I mean, people watched I Love Lucy. It was watchable as opposed to line of dialogue, no time to breathe, next line <laughs> of dialogue, no time to breathe, next line of dialogue. I'm exhausted as I watch the opening scenes of this. I know I what was- you mean. I was literally gasping it's, for air. It's difficult because, because you blink and panic. Yeah, you I was panic I was panicky. I was hyperventilating something. as I'm watching this. Yeah. All right, I promised I would mention that one other Roger Ebert thing. Now, just like as you view Faster Pussycat as prototypical Meyer, uh-huh. maybe not even so much as being the best example, but the most well-known example sure. and the easiest to talk about and where those uh, those things might not be the most obvious, but the most widespread. Mm-hmm. That's the same for me with Roger Ebert and Russ Meyer, where he's worked with Russ Meyer before, but I feel like this is the most definitive example. He was the sole writer credited on the screenplay. This is the movie everybody knows as that weird movie Roger Ebert did with Russ Meyer. But he also worked on this thing called Who Killed Bambi? which was a Sex Pistols movie. Oh, yeah. He, yeah, uh, I heard about that. I co-wrote that, it with the Sex Pistols manager. Mm-hmm. And in being kind of the opposite of what Fox did with this movie, you know, Meyer was going to direct this, didn't really have a hand in writing. I'm sure as things started filming, he sure. would, you know, make things up and what have you. But Fox read the Bambi script and they said, we can't possibly yeah. allow you to film this. This is absurd. The only thing I know about it, I haven't read it myself yet, but there's a an opening scene where they kill a deer or yeah, something. Yeah. Fox just read this thing and said, We're not turning this. Well, into and they a were movie. originally hoping to make it kind of a movie starring the Sex Pistols, and then they all fucking died. Yeah, well that it made it impossible. Too. So realizing that and uh kind of coming to terms with the fact this would never get made and was not profitable, or maybe just jumping on that crazy internet revolution. Ebert, a couple of years back, actually published the script online. Mm-hmm. So you can read that for free on yep. his website. So we'll link off to that. But uh, if you're just dying after Beyond the Valley of the Dolls to get some more uh, weird Roger Ebert script, that would be the spot to That's go. That's the only spot to go. To get to that spot, however, I would first recommend going to a one doublefeatureshow.com. Yeah, that if you go be... there right now, you might be able to click the episode right at the top of the page and get on there hassle-free. Otherwise, uh, search for yeah, I mean, Dollhouse or something. If it's Don't not search there... for Dollhouse because it'll just be me talking about Joss Whedon a thousand times. If it's not there, you can email us, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Oh, man, it's like you were prepared to give our email address right there. I just, I know how this shit goes. Aside from a uh, glorious iTunes page where you can leave a review thing that sure. I neglect to talk about all the time. And an inglorious Facebook. You mean the social network? That's what I meant. We have to discuss the uh, the movies next sure. time on the show. We're actually doing Rise of the Planet of the Apes, which is the new Planet of the Apes film, uh-huh. and Attack the Block. So Planet of the Apes we talked about. We did. You are informing me, and I'm taking your word, although I never do this, and uh-huh. I'm so rigid about making sure we go sequentially on these things. Having only seen the first Planet of the Apes, you'd say this is more like a prequel and that I don't have to see the other 10,000 films. Not at all. You only need to see the movie that we've already covered on the show, so that covers our asses fully. But there's a weird question about if this movie is badgering science or not. Yeah. And I want to talk about that a lot, and ultimately that's what convinced me to go, okay... We're not going to have time to do all the Planet of the Apes films in some weird, probably quasi-Rocky Asia thing. It'll take us 25 fucking years to get to Rise of the Planet of the Apes. or Star Trek. Yeah, so why don't we just uh, go ahead? I believe what you're looking for is why don't we just watch more fucking film? You do it so much better than me. Bye.